Hi, everyone. Welcome to the podcast. We are honored and welcome to have back Mr. Bill Holter on the podcast, which we have monthly. As you will remember, he is a seasoned uh, stockbroker and a gold and silver bug expert with many, many decades of experience in the financial industry. And he's going to be navigating us through these interesting and turbulent times in the month of October. Also, the the new month of the physical quarter of the new year. So there's a lot to discuss and we'll be looking forward to what he has to say. Again, if you are new to the channel, please do like, subscribe and share and hit that notification bell so you don't miss a moment of the updates. Bill Holter, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing today? Good. Thanks for having me, John. As always a pleasure. Always a pleasure, Bill. Okay, so um, starting off at the top, as you know, interesting development. We see uh, 45,000 uh, seaport workers on strike right now on the East Coast. And apparently, as I was looking into it, it goes up and down the entire Eastern seaboard through Florida and I potentially, I guess, possibly in your neck of the woods near Texas. Um, so I guess the question I would have is, is this one of the black swan events and how long do you think the strike will last? Uh, there's no telling how long it will last. Um, I actually, a good friend of mine, uh, had a, a suggestion that the governors of each state that has one of these ports, like for instance, Greg Abbott, call in the National Guard to run the port or to run the ports. Um, I mean, you could go back to uh, the 1980s when the air, air traffic controllers were uh, going to go on strike and Ronald Reagan said, whatever it was, was you got Three days to go back on the job or we'll replace you um i i do i do want to say though that the, the wages on the east coast are only about 65 or 70 percent of what they are on the west coast so i you know i can understand where they're coming from the ramifications are are going to be huge if this thing lasts more than a week or two weeks um, I mean, even at two weeks, it's going to disrupt the supply chains. No question about it. Um, the first week, you know, you there was a uh, the head of the uh, longshoreman was on yesterday doing a an interview, and he said, "Yeah, the first week they'll be talking about it on the news. The second week it'll start to get serious, and then after the third week, stuff's not going to start be showing up, and." From a from an availability standpoint, stuff's not going to be available, and whatever is available, you're going to see a massive spike in inflation. Mm -hmm. Things are going to cost a lot more in a in a pretty short period of time. Yeah, I, I was thinking about that, Bill, because the last time we talked, you were you had a great sort of juxtaposition in terms of the way to describe it of you know hyper inflation of the things we need and hyper deflation of the things we have. This seems like it's a model recipe for that. Um, I was reading for every day that the, the ports are down, it, it's going to take six days to recover. So like you said, if it takes a week or two, we could be looking at uh, potentially a two month recovery process for the holidays. Right. If we're, for, if well, we're fortunate. Mean, a, yeah, a lot of stuff. I mean, it, it, stuff for the holidays, unless it's already here, it's not going to get here. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if we go, a, we go a month, if we get into, into November, the Christmas season, then stuff's not going to get here. Yeah. Yeah. And like you said, massive ramifications and retail cars obviously are going to be effectuated with that. So yeah, it's a whole domino effect. Um, yeah. Thank you for that. As we, as I look at the Dow going back to 2001 bill, I think it was trading around the $10,000 mark and now it's over 40,000 or 41,000, nearly four times where it was yet gold is now eight times higher than it was. So it seems gold is outpacing the markets. Do you see this trend continuing over the next five to 10 years? And if so, assuming the Fed does get audited, how high do you think gold could go? Uh, well, first off, gold is up tenfold. It's not up eightfold. Okay. Gold was 270. In 2000, 2001, gold was bottom. It actually bottomed at 252. So here we are at 2650. That's more than a 10 by. Mm -hmm. And understand that that's a tenfold return with no risk. When I say no risk, an ounce of gold cannot bankrupt. Whereas, uh, you know, companies within the Dow or companies within the S&P or whatever, they can and they have, and they will continue to bankrupt. Uh, 
asking about uh, you know high how how high can gold go? Uh, that's a question that no one can answer. And if anyone gives you an answer, they're full of shit because we don't have the numerator, we don't have the denominator. Mm -hmm. When I say that, uh, we have no idea how much more money supply and how much more debt is going to be piled onto the system. And the other side of the equation, we don't know how much gold the U.S. really actually has. Um, I mean, we've, we claim that we have 8,300 tons of gold, and that's not been audited since the 1950s. So in reality, how much gold do we have? Uh, we know that gold was flying out the door left and right in the late 1960s with the London gold pool. So how much, you know, how much is actually left? We we don't know. So to give a to to put a number out there, you can't do it. And the only thing I will say is whatever number you have in your head is is gonna be way low because the inverse of zero which is the intrinsic value of dollars, the inverse of zero is infinity. So, you know, mm -hmm. somewhere between here and infinity. Yeah, yeah. So given where we are, Bill, approaching the 2,700 mark, like you were saying, and thank you for the, the correction on the tenfold, I'll make a note of that. Um, do you think it's, again, not uh, taking into consideration what you said, not knowing what the real numbers are, numerator, denominator, uh, I know some banks and stuff are, are, are pontificating that could be 2,900 to 3,000 by year's end. Do you see that as a, a distinct possibility? Uh, I mean, you could see that happen in a day's time. With all the black swans that are flying around out there, if you get one of them to really lay a goose egg, I mean, we could be at 3,000 in, in a day's time. So. Mm -hmm. And that said, we've had a big run. We should and are due for some type of pullback, but it looks like the demand worldwide, and not North American demand, but this is you know global demand, mm -hmm. is continuing extremely strong, and they're not letting they're not letting the waterfall uh, paper sales on Comex. They're not letting those happen. Every time there's softness. We get an, you know immediately we get buyers and you're even seeing it in silver. I mean thirty dollars now is a floor, so we're bouncing between thirty and uh, thirty two fifty. And I would say if you see silver go through and close thirty two fifty thirty three, we're gonna have another big leg up. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna ask you about silver. Funny enough, that you should mention that. Um, we saw it, I think it's over 30, 32, 16 or something as of this morning when I checked. Um, last time you and I talked, you know, we were talking about in respect to silver, the, the different values it has in terms of you know, manufacturing uses and, and so forth. Um, people, I don't think, some people realize, but I think the general public may not realize the household items they have, their silver cutlery, you know, maybe antique stuff like that, silver plate, you know, teacups and, and, and flatware, things of that nature. Uh, solar panels is a good example, um, have I believe two ounces of silver uh, in them. As silver continues to exponentially go and people start to realize at some point the true value of it, do, you know, you've been talking before about like a Mad Max scenario. That's why I'm bringing it up. Do you think people are gonna be trying to find ways to extract silver out of household items that they have once they realize the intrinsic value of it? Yeah, at some price, and at, at this price, not even close. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if it wasn't thirty dollars silver, if it was three dollars or three hundred dollars silver, um, you might have uh, people trying to turn turn products. Uh, and when I say products, I mean there's there's silver in your computer, there's silver in your in your uh, smartphones mm -hmm. there's there's silver silver is used everywhere because it's the best uh conductor of electricity so yeah you could have that you saw that uh around 1980 when silver ran to 50 bucks you had people turning their cutlery in and and cashing in mm. i mean i don't think you're not going to see big supply from that we're running a huge 
annual uh, global deficit of it's it's said to be somewhere in the 200 300 uh uh metric ton i'm sorry uh 2003 what is it uh 200 i'm sorry it's 200 million to 300 million ounces that's what it is that's the the current deficit and i personally think that that deficit is much higher because it's pretty clear that just solar on its own is 450 million ounces that's what the world is using right now to produce uh solar panels the total global production is 900 million ounces or a little bit less. So that's half right there of all global production. And the, the, uh, the official numbers have solar panels being uh, using less than 200 million ounces. So the there's a, what I'm getting at is there's a question as to what the real numbers are. Mm -hmm. And Add to that that there's no big stockpiles any in, anywhere in the world. So there is for gold. And you've got uh, central banks own something like 35,000 uh, metric tons of gold. So that's a big stockpile. There are no big stockpiles of silver. So if we get a, a big spike in price, it's really not. I mean, there's there's no big stockpile to come in and fill this deficit. So all I could say is silver, and the, these are the words of my my past partner Jim Sinclair. Silver is going to be gold on steroids, mm -hmm. and also silver is uh, in a Mad Max uh, situation. Silver is the money of the people, and gold is the money of kings. So there's going to be way more demand for silver just because you're going to have the little guy who can't afford even maybe even an ounce of gold uh, is going to be looking to buy a few ounces of silver. So it, it's, it will be a, uh, a tsunami of demand. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's what I was driving at, Bill, the question, because, you know, there's a lot of people listening and different places in their lives, right? Some have been preparing for years, some have been preparing for the last you know, year, six months, but there's a lot of contingent of the society who just doesn't know about silver or what we know uh, that as it starts to go, like you said, 100, 200, whatever the number is, they're gonna start looking for creative ways to uh, you know, get in the game or liquidate it to try to get a cash position, especially with layoffs and uh, you know, the economy uh, decreasing before it improves, people are going to need a, a stopgap. So that's why I was curious to see what you thought about that. Um, it looks like, Bill, the Fed is planning, I believe, one or two more rate cuts for the year. I, I, it could be this month or it could be November 7th. Uh, initially, I heard the talk was 25 basis points two months, but now there's discussion about one more aggressive 50 basis point cut. This will obviously affect the dollar index as a whole, especially against, like you said, the foreign currency market. Um, where do you imagine the dollar index rate will be by year's end with all this in mind? Uh, technically, we should be getting a bounce from these levels because the dollar is very oversold. Mm -hmm. um, if you had a couple of rate cuts, it's, it will probably end lower. I don't know, mid-90s. Um, I mean, I hate to, to talk about levels or price and time at the same time because, sure. I mean, that's a fool's game. Uh, I would first say, why is the Federal Reserve, why did they cut 50 basis points? I mean, that is like a panic rate cut. And that's what they did in 2008. Mm -hmm. it's, it's what they do when something breaks. And supposedly, nothing is broken. Everything is great. We have this fabulous economy. Right. Uh, one one thought is that it's a it's a political move it's to try to goose this economy going into the election, but you know there's really not that much time for it to, to, to take effect. Although you know it, it does support markets so that they don't they're they're hopeful that there's no 
a big stock market debacle between now and, and the election. My thought is there, there are some things that are real shaky behind the scenes and they don't want, they don't want to e even allow a chance of derivatives going into meltdown phase mm -hmm. because that's where we're headed. That's where ultimately mathematically uh, derivatives are going to melt down. I mean, you've got over two quadrillion in derivatives and do we even have a full one quadrillion dollars worth of assets on the planet? So that is the definition of the tail wagging the dog. So I, I would just question, you know, why did they cut? A, why did they cut with markets at all time highs, gold mm -hmm. at all time highs, uh, the housing market still pretty close to all time highs. And the only thing that's really completely cracked is commercial real estate. And I mean, that's going to be a complete debacle because, I mean, if you're talking about a trillion dollars worth of loans, who's going to eat those losses? Where oh, do those go? Those go on the Fed balance sheet also. And, and the Fed already is A, insolvent, technically mm -hmm. insolvent, mm -hmm. and B, technically bankrupt. And and losing money every day. Yeah, and, and to your point, Bill, in our last podcast, um, they're also massively lying about the numbers of unemployment and inflation and job markets and All the numbers. retail, everything. So yeah. they have to cover it up with rate right. cuts because they're not going to tell people, you know, that they've been lying the whole time. So, you know, it's it, it, it is it is silly, but, you know, but it's I think we're going to see that come out here pretty soon. Um, another question I want to ask you, Bill, is month over month this year, we've seen a steady growth in the S&P 500 index. I've heard it said that it could reach 7,000 before the end of the year. I'm wondering why is that a significant, um, the S&P obviously, other than looking at the stock market, what does that translate to though, in your mind, if anything, for the global economy short and long term, if the S&P continues to go up? Well, if the S&P is 7,000 by the end of the year, you can bet inflation is well into double digits. Mm. I mean, historically, stock markets crash. And what happens is when a, a currency crashes, uh, the stock market crashes with it. And then all of a sudden, it stops going down and starts going higher. Uh, I mean, you could look at, at Venezuela, Argentina, Zimbabwe, uh, Russia years ago. You could look at any any country that's hyperinflated their currency. Their stock market goes down, mm -hmm. and then it stops going down with the currency still going down, and it starts to go straight up. Uh, I think it was what was it, last year the best stock market in the world was Zimbabwe's stock market, and but in in the Zimbabwe currency, mm -hmm. not in dollars. Right. And what happens is, yeah, the stock market might might double but the currency is down by more than 50%. So your actual purchasing power is down. But, uh, you know, businesses, real activity is a way to try to keep up with, uh, keep up with inflation. The ultimate way to keep up infl with inflation is just to hold real money and that's gold and silver. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you brought that up, Bill. Uh, thank you, because that's another good segue talking about, you know, using country comparison of, you know, the currency market versus the asset market, gold and silver. Because on that note, as you know, Japan's been very quiet and stealthy during this period, but they've been, as you know, reeling from the 10-year treasury bonds they've been holding, not unlike the rest of the world. And it seems like they've been running into the safety of precious metals. I think they're, they've devalued their currency, I think somewhere close to 25%, if I'm not mistaken. Um, with that being said, it's clear they're making a move into gold like a lot of other central banks and throughout the world. Um, do you see them running into the bricks at some point sooner than later? Japan? Yeah, yes, Japan. Uh, that would be an interesting one. If Japan were to, to become one of the BRICS nations, I mean, that would be a complete fracture mm -hmm. of the West. I mean, that would be like, uh, Great Britain or France or Germany or one of the G7, or they are part of the G7. I mean, that would be a complete disaster if they actually uh, applied for and joined the BRICS. I mean, what would that say for the dollar? What would that say for the Western financial system? It would, 
they would be ringing a bell saying it's over. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, it's going to be interesting to see because they're going to have to make a move, right? Because they're they're hemorrhaging our treasury bonds so badly and they've got to dump them like every other country. They're going to have to make a move one way or the other. So it seems like under, like you said, behind the scenes, surreptitiously, they're they're making moves to at least you know, improve their position with precious metals as they should do. Um, as you know, Bill, we saw many factions of the BRICS, speaking of them, met last week at the annual UN um, conference uh, in New York City. It looks like they're gearing up for the summit for BRICS, which is less than three weeks away in Moscow. Uh, apparently some big announcements were made at the conference. Um, I talked recently with uh, Peter Schiff and he believes that by the time BRICS meets that they're not gonna make an announcement, they're just going to de-dollarize in a clandestine clandestine effort since they kind of were talking individually at, at the UN summit. I'm just wondering if you agree with his assessment on that. Um, yeah, that's a logical way for them to do it. I mean, rather than make an announcement, just do it. Mm -hmm. Because making an announcement, uh, if you want to call it, it's it, those are fighting words, if you will. Um, so yeah, just, just implementing a de-dollarization, and I don't know whether I mean we this BRICS meeting, they could make an announcement and say that's it, we're no longer using the vote. Mm -hmm. That's probably you'd have World War Three uh, right on the heels of that, and that would be uh, the biggest monetary event since 1944 in Bretton, Bretton mm -hmm. Woods. Uh, I think it's more likely that you know they'll end the meeting uh, with a communique with uh, important items in it. But yeah, I definitely could see them uh, testing and using trade settlement that's non-dollar. And, and you've got more and more countries all over the world wanting to join that because it's pretty clear who's going to win and who's going to lose. I mean, the West is a, it's a, bankrupting financial slash monetary system mm -hmm. and you've got the BRICS saying that they're going to come out with a currency that is commodity backed and they're going to back that currency somewhere with somewhere between 20 and 40 percent gold right right because i think the BRICS, if i'm not mistaken is already holding about 40 percent gold as part of their backing now so yeah it makes sense totally what you're saying in a controlled demolition that. What's that? We don't know that. Okay. We don't know that. There's no way to know because you don't know how many units are going to be issued. Mm -hmm. I mean, how much currency is going to be issued? I think it's an off. I mean, it's got to be a, a big number. If they're going to clear trade with this currency, it's got to be an absolute huge number. So uh, the gold at the current price, I don't think there's enough gold out there to, to even do 20%, certainly not 40%, backing hmm. to a currency that settles trade at the current price. So what's going to have to happen is they're going to have to revalue gold higher to get it to a level where it equals whatever number they're looking for, 20%, 30%, 40%, whatever backing they're looking for, mm -hmm. they're going to have to revalue gold higher to make that fit. Yeah, and it'll be interesting to see what that number will be. Like you said, it's, it's just fascinating to watch how this all plays out and all these you know moves and counter moves. Um, speaking of which, uh, again, this is another thing Peter said to me in our last interview that kind of confused me a little bit. So I was kind of hoping you could educate all of us on this. Uh, we, he and I were talking about the commercial and the residential real estate market like you and I have talked about in the past and how you and I are pretty... On the, much on the same page that we're going to, we're already seeing commercial real estate, like you said, completely implode, but we have to believe that that's going to have some type of, uh, you know, domino or, re or detrimental effect, you know, bleeding into the residential market. And so I asked him about that because he had, he had said one time that he thought uh, residential real estate could go down as much as 80 to 90%, whether that's the end of this year or first quarter next year, somewhere in the foreseeable future. And so when I brought that up, uh, he was saying that he sees a decrease in the reg residential real estate market between 80 to 90% in gold and not against the dollar. I thought if the dollar right. was weakening and gold was strengthening its position, 
that that it would be the other way around. Can you weigh in on this uh, dilemma a little bit? Yeah, if the dollar's weakening, let's say that the that real estate drops fifty percent, and the dollar uh, the dollar weakens fifty percent, they sure. they want down together. Well, when you measure uh, real estate that let's say goes down fifty percent, and gold is now instead of twenty five hundred, it's five thousand. Mm -hmm. Now, real estate versus gold has gone down seventy five percent. So it all depends on what you're measuring. That's been the problem for, well, most of my lifetime. I mean, since, call it, uh, since 1971, when we went off the gold standard, that's been the problem is that the dollar has been the measuring stick, but the dollar is not a constant value. It's not a constant uh, unit. One ounce of gold is one ounce of gold. It's not 1.1, it's not 0.9, it's one ounce of gold. It's a measuring stick that doesn't change. Mm -hmm. and, and that's been the problem is, I mean, like we started this interview off with, the Dow was at 10,000 in, in, in the year 2000. Now it's 40,000. So it's up fourfold in dollar terms. But gold is up tenfold. So this century, the stock market in terms of gold is down, not up. Right. Okay. So let's say, for example, Bill, between now and as an, just as a rough example, between now and say March of the first quarter next year, let's say gold goes between three to 4,000 and you were people who have a cash position who've, you know, gone against, uh, been contrarian against the dollar and, and what the deep state's trying to do to, uh, to the public. And they've, they've invested properly. They've improved their position. Um, do you think most, most, uh, land, people who are selling land or, or, you know, selling houses, whether it's the direct owner or the real estate firm is going to take payment in, in gold, or do you think it'll still be a cash position or maybe a combination of the two? No, well, any sales, I mean, you can do a contract in anything you want. You could do it in oil. You could do it in rice. Mm -hmm. You could do it in gold or silver, but the contracts, 99.99% of them are done in dollars. And then at closing, the seller takes those dollars and, and does what he wants with it. You know, buys, buys gold, buys silver, uh, buys another piece of real estate, whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how it's converted. It's not, uh, I mean, I, I don't see in the immediate future, in the next three months, six months, a year, I don't see uh, contracts all of a sudden being written in gold that would be that would be after the dollar has imploded mm. okay okay that, that's what i was trying to figure out is for people who are in that going to be in that position what what should be their hedging position so that that kind of helps clarify thank you for that um well, last john, question for let, let's sure. john let, just to go back understand and most people and i'm going to say it is the majority of people don't buy gold because they understand gold. They buy gold because it's going up. They buy gold because they want to take a profit at a later date in dollars. And when this whole, the whole uh, scam, fraud, Ponzi scheme, when, mm -hmm. when this whole thing is done, either you're in gold and silver or you're not because you're not going to be able to get it. It will go into hiding. There's no, I mean, the supply is not there for the world to cash out of an imploding system and into gold and silver. Understand that the reason you own gold is because it cannot bankrupt in a world that is bankrupting. Hmm. It's going to be gold and silver will be the last men standing. Gold and silver are money themselves. All of these fiat currencies, think about the names the pound, the lira, the dollar, the peso, those are all terms of weight. And the question is weight of what? Well, it's weight of gold or weight of silver. So those currencies originally were derivatives off of gold and off of silver. And then of course they got bastardized 
1971 when the U.S. and when the U.S. went off the gold standard, there was no gold backing anywhere on the planet. Everything was fiat. So they've retained their old names, that their names referring to the weight of gold or the weight of silver. But there's no silver, there's no gold backing to anything. It's a completely fake, fraudulent fiat money system. So just understand that the reason the reason you want, and people call gold and silver a, a lifeboat off the Titanic. The reason you want them is because they can't bankrupt. They can't sink while the main ship goes down. Mm -hmm. No, that's, that's right. Thank you for clarifying that and articulating that. So I think one of the questions we always typically get in our, in our podcast from a lot of people is how much, how much silver or in this case, silver should they have? And I believe you said at one point, if I'm not mistaken, your recommendation as a rule of thumb was a thousand thousand dollars per person per household. Is that still kind of your general rule of thumb? Not a thousand dollars, a thousand dollars base. Okay. Of junk. If you can afford to do that, and you're looking at about a, a bag of junk right now is about twenty four thousand dollars. So, hmm. if you can afford to do that, if you've got a family of four, and you know you've got ninety six hundred thousand dollars, yeah, buy four bags of junk. That will get you more than through what's coming, whether it lasts a year, two years, three years. You're not going to run out of junk to barter with. Um, as far as a mix goes, you do want to be heavier in silver than gold, unless you're talking big money and you've got a storage problem for the silver. Right. And to, to be even heavier than that, I don't have a problem with that because at 85 to 1, the ratio, 85 ounces of silver buys one ounce of gold. It comes out of the ground at 10 to 1. So one of those two ratios is right, and one of them is wrong. And I would bet on God's ratio because it comes out of the ground at 10 to 1, not 85 to 1. Okay. Thank you. That's that's really valuable. You know, it's funny. It's interesting you should mention uh, the ratios because I, that was going to be my last question for today, which is as we look at the U.S. debt clock, we can see the dollar to gold and silver ratios increasing while the paper to gold and silver ratios are decreasing. So for the layman person, what does that mean for them in terms of uh, the U.S. economy and the overall landscape of things? Give me these two ratios again. I've had uh, this question on the, on the debt clock. And I think the problem is uh, at one point in time, people were saying, well, why is gold and silver zero? Mm -hmm. And that was just a function of uh, M2 money supply was actually declining. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it would make, because of the mathematics of it, it would make, uh, it, would make it a negative number. So I'm not sure what, what you're asking as far as the no, I just, it's just, I get that question a lot about the debt clock. We see, you know, the, the, the ratios of, you know, gold and silver increasing to the paper, the gold ratios are decreasing. And so I just thought if people could hear from you, if there's any significance to that in terms of the debt clock, something they should be looking for, maybe. I think that's, I think that's a meaningless statistic. Okay. Uh, just understand that we live in a, in a Ponzi scheme where, there has to be constantly new capital coming into the system to pay off the past debt, as opposed to the past investors in, a, in you know your your typical Ponzi scheme. In in this system, when when debt is issued, the interest doesn't even exist to pay. So in order to make that debt payable, the money supply has to be increased. And if the money supply does not increase, then the system collapses. And that's where Richard Russell for years and years talked about it's either inflate or die. You have to inflate the money supply every time debt, in order to inflate the money supply, you got to create debt. But every time you create debt, you've got to create more debt because the interest on that new debt doesn't exist to pay. So if you, if you, if you stop the increase of the money supply, then you're choking off the ability for the, the past debt to be paid off. And that's where you get a debt implosion 
and understand that all of these fiat currencies are debt based. They're supported by debt. So I guess you could, you, you mentioned earlier about inflation, hyperinflation of the things we need. Mm -hmm. and that's a function of, of the currencies dropping in value and hyper deflation of the things we have. And that's a function of the credit markets imploding because, because of non-payment. And when I say because of non-payment, unless you increase the money supply, the debt cannot be paid off. It can't be, not only can it not be paid off, but it can't be, uh, it can't be serviced. They can't pay the monthly or every six months or whatever the, the contract calls for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the whole thing just kind of implodes basically. So, well, I just wanted to, you know, explore that. Uh, US it's, Sorry. It starts, it starves is what happens. The system starves. I mean, it, Richard Russell is exactly right. You either inflate the money supply, you either inflate the system or the system dies because it starves. It, it, it eats its own tail. It can't, mm. it cannot continue forward unless new debt is created and new money supply is created. It cannot shrink. Yeah, it's, 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 it's very... If it shrinks, it, 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 it deflates to zero. It implodes. Yeah, it's unsustainable. Absolutely. So, well, I appreciate you again going through all that. Um, Bill, as we wrap up always, as we always do, uh, any last words you have for the audience and where can people find your work? Yeah, I mean, I've, I guess for the last six months, been finishing interview, interviews by just saying, do the best you can. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people have, have different means or ability to do things. Just do the best you can with what you have and do it as quickly as possible because there's so many things out there now that for, I mean, for tomorrow morning, there's probably eight or 10 things that could happen overnight. It basically means markets will be closed by the weekend. Mm -hmm. When I say by the weekend, I mean, because everything is so interconnected, the world will not spin more than three times. It will not go more than 72 hours. If you if you have something that sets off the derivatives time bomb. So just do the best you can. Uh, don't beat yourself up when you find out you forgot something because everybody's gonna forget something. And if you understand that this is needed uh, to try to protect yourself, protect your family, do it as fast as you can because these black swans are multiplying. There's more and more of them every day. Uh, and to get uh, to, to read my work, to, to see what I'm posting, uh, my website is billholter.com. And if you've got questions for me, uh, you can. there is an icon on the website uh, or you can go directly to my business email. It's B-H-O-L-T-E-R at proton.me. Yep. And also, folks, Bill is part of the Miles Frankham family, which we work with, as you know, directly. So um, I will be planning on working with Bill in the near future as well. So we humbly recommend uh, giving him a call. He's got, as you can see, loads of experience that can really benefit you and your family in the upcoming days, weeks and months ahead. Bill Holter, thank you for joining us on the podcast. We always look forward to having you. Thanks again. Have a blessed rest of your day. Thank you, John.